Right, it's uh, been a very long day for all of you. Just as a matter of interest, uh, can I get a rough idea of what the audience break up? Is it a lot of uh, echocardiographers, cardiac technicians, congenital heart disease specialists, adults, cardiologists, trainees? Thank you. So I'm a congenital interventional cardiologist and I was asked to talk on how and when to replace the pulmonary valve. Um, uh, I've given similar talks in the past and really the issue is what has changed in the, changed in the last decade uh, in this area and I'll say not a lot but there are some things uh, that have changed but we still don't know answers. Um, a little bit of a, a background and really this is a complement to the congenital cardiac surgeons. If we look at the background history of Tetralogy of Fellow uh, which is the commonest congenital cyanotic condition if you go back and look historically, um, there was a 33% mortality in untreated patients at a year, 50% mortality at three years, only 10% alive at 20 years in the 1960s. Uh, in the 1980s, probably 80% of these patients are now surviving to adulthood. So there's been a surgical evolution from uh, initial palliation to primary repair of, of, of this condition. Uh, and surgical relief of the right ventricular outflow tract that we're now left with a set of problems that are very different to what people were experiencing 50 years ago. So in fact what we're dealing with is with the success that the congenital cardiac surgeons have had with this condition. So at one point it was considered that the pulmonary valve was not particularly important in the circulation and certainly when I was training in London in the mid-1990s we were just getting the first group of uh, tetralogy of fellow patients coming through in their 40s and 50 years of age um, who had significant compromise because of the dysfunctional right ventricular outflow tract and who needed, or who needed pulmonary valve replacements. Um, so this has led to a, a really a new dilemma which is um, whatever solution we have for the right ventricular outflow tract and for the pulmonary outflow tract uh, none of the uh, procedures are, are perfect. And if you do have a dysfunctional outflow tract, it's going to lead to right ventricular dilatation, it's going to lead to arrhythmia, uh, and with that there's going to be the risk of death. So some of these patients, by the time uh, they're getting into their third and fourth decades, will have had four or five procedures. There's this continual interplay between what are the indications for pulmonary valve replacement what are the procedures that are actually uh, available. Now this is a, an infamous, uh, notorious interview with uh, Donald Rumsfeld. So, so I think I might be like Donald Rumsfeld and uh, avoid the question as well. But basically, there are um, some known unknowns, and that's we don't know when the perfect time is for um, to replace the pulmonary valve. Is we have a good idea, but uh, sometimes it's it's probably too late. So the easy bit is what can you do? Uh, if you need to replace a pulmonary valve, well there's surgery, that's traditional, it's been around for a long time and in the last decade we've seen a boom in the uh, endovascular approach to, to valve replacement and, and there are uh, there's sort of a clear mandate for uh, selected patients for that. For so surgery, Richard will talk about the, the various options and there are multiple options available. The fact that there are multiple options available tells us that there isn't a perfect solution. Um, some of these uh, surgical replacements will last for six months and some will last for 30 years. For the individual patient it's very difficult to know but usually after about a decade a lot of them will need replacing or revising. So the endovascular approach, uh, not playing, this is the, the typical uh, options available at the moment. There are a lot that are coming online in, in the next few years I'm sure. There's the first uh, endovascular approach or transcatheter valve which is the Melody valve which was first implanted in about 2001, but it's only suitable for RV to PA connections or conduits which are about between 18 and 22 millimeters. Now you can fudge it a little bit on either side of that, but that's uh, what the company would recommend. 
And similarly, Edwards have valves between 29, uh, sorry, 20 and 29 millimeters. And the problem for all of these is that you need a good anchor point. Now, the question about when to time or when to put in a, a pulmonary valve, um, there are two indications. Obviously, there's the stenosis, but there's regurgitation. And most patients have mixed stenosis and regurgitation. And people have looked at the, at the right ventricular volumes, both pre- and post-pulmonary uh, post valve replacement. And it is quite clear that uh, surgical um, replacement does reduce the volume of the right ventricle, and that's a good thing. And similarly, patients' ability to exert themselves also improves. So that's quite well documented. But the timing isn't so well documented. So here's a, a graph showing that patients who had um, pulmonary valve replacements uh, after 20 years of age and those who had pulmonary valve replacements before 20 years of age. And those that have had them before 20 years of age, you can see that the surgical valves deteriorate. So that's a, a deterioration of the actual valves much more quickly in that small patient. And there may be several reasons for that, a mismatch in size, putting in a valve that's too big. But the point that I'm making here is that none of the solu solutions are, are perfect. The endovascular approach is not uh, perfect, and uh, neither is the, um, um, the surgical approach. Sorry, no, none of these are playing. That's oh. what, why we are playing there. Okay. Oh, they are. Sorry, they're playing. Uh, okay, sorry for that. So here you can see this is a typical percutaneous pulmonary valve uh, replacement. Here's a wire. This is a lateral view. You can see the sternal wires there. And you can see there's to and fro pulmonary regurgitation. You can see the conduit with a nice smooth line. In the next picture, this is a, uh, a conduit that's had a stent put in. And there you can see the outer balloon on the melody valve being expanded. And the end result, which has really been quite nicely worked up in terms of MRI studies, you can see an injection in the pulmonary um, artery, you can see there's no regurgitation. And if you compare that to the first angiogram where there's free pulmonary <coughs> regurgitation, that really works quite well. And the fantastic advantage um, to this is that the patient can go home the next day. But it's not a, uh, without its problems. Uh, the stents can fracture, although that's less of a problem now. And these valves are prone to endocarditis, probably a 2% per year, uh, uh, per patient year. One of the big problems for us in the percutaneous world is this is a very dynamic outflow tract. You can see uh, that putting in a pulmonary valve into that is going to be extremely difficult with the dynamic change in the geometry of that pulmonary outflow tract. Um, this is the first case uh, done in 2009 by Philip Bonhoeffer where you put in a self-expanding uh, stent valve. So this really would have been the pre, uh, precursor to things like the core valve and more recently the P valve. So you can see this is a patient who had actually had five previous uh, stenotomies and really the, there wasn't felt to be a surgical option. So he's had his balloon, his pulmonary outflow tract balloon interrogated. You can see there's a little bit of a valve waste in there. And this is the first self-expanding stent valve that went in, so using nitinol technology and a, um, a bioprosthetic valve. And it worked reasonably well as the patient was able to get back to sailing and doing things like that, which previously he was unable to do. Um, more recently, the Chinese have started to make uh, valves, which are really, you can see, very similar to uh, the original study or the original valve produced in 2009. And I'm not sure how many of these have been put in, but I think probably around 50 in the world now. Um, and so that the, I think we'll see a lot more about this in over the next five years. And so this is a real challenge. This is what the pulmonary outflow tracts look like. The surgeons obviously can do something here, but sometimes they don't want to because these patients will have had four or five operations already. Not all of them, but timing of pulmonary valve, it really is an evolving strategy. Um, Here's a, a, a right ventricle that measures 800 milliliters in diastole. So that's an absolutely huge right ventricle. And one would say, well, we've definitely left it too long. We should have done something sooner. And after a surgical pulmonary valve replacement, yes, his index volume is way down. But at a price, every bypass operation, his ejection fraction is, is starting to drop down. So when is too early? Well, it's never too early if the solution is perfect, but we don't have a perfect solution. So current surgical and endovascular strategies, percutaneous pulmonary valves, 
are all essentially palliative for oh, up to a decade, but that's not too bad and, and probably a lot of them will last longer than that. When it's too late? Well, we saw that picture from the patient with nearly 800 mil in diastolic volume of his right ventricle. There is an analogy from the ASD world. We say that if you don't close a, a sig hemodynamically significant atrial septal defect uh, by 14 years of age, the right ventricle will not remodel. But we're quite happy to let right ventricles dilate up in the context of an absent pulmonary valve uh, or a deficient uh, or dysfunctional RV to PA connection to much higher volumes than that. So it's difficult to know. So we know what normal RV volumes are. We know that the RV is always abnormal pre and post intervention. There isn't a perfect solution. We know that exercise capacity is affected. We know that there is a risk of death in these patients. Uh, we know that, um, that patients can be symptomatic, but often chronic patients don't claim they have very, very many symptoms, so it can be underplayed. So we have gone from pulmonary regurgitation is unimportant in the mid-1950s, 1960s, 1970s, when cardiac surgery was really taking off, uh, to now doing pulmonary valve replacement, and now what we're trying to refine is when is the optimal time to do it. So indications for pulmonary valve replacement, increasing right ventricular size, new tricuspid regurgitation, the severity of the pulmonary regurgitation, uh, if there's an arrhythmia present, particularly if the QRS duration is more than 180 milliseconds, associated lesions that need intervention in, the, in their own right, and when I say intervention I mean surgical or transcatheter, VSDs, aneurysms, tricuspid regurgitation, branch pulmonary artery stenosis, anticipated problems, pregnancy and the, and the stress that places on the heart, and in particular symptoms. If patients are symptomatic, that is always felt to be um, a, a good indication to proceed. Um, MRI is probably the investigation of, of choice at the moment, but not everyone can have an MRI. We've just seen a whole lot of pace, patients with pacing leads in that group uh, usually MRIs can be more problematic. Currently, the literature suggests uh, that an index right ventricular volume of more than 150, and these are all the different studies published in the last decade, between 150 and 170 mils per kilogram, uh, sorry, mils per meter squared, those patients should probably have um, their RV to PA connection rehabilitated either surgically or transcatheter. A new concept that's coming across that's been a lot of the cardiac meet meetings recently is this whole concept of fibrosis burden. How much is the, what is the burden of fibrosis on the right ventricle? And maybe this will help in due course decide it, or add to deciding about the timing of, a, of pulmonary valve replacement. So we don't have a single test at the moment. All our solutions, all our investigations all have limitations. So the basics still apply for this group of patients. You need a structured approach. You need serial review. For, so for any one patient, you need to review them on a serial basis and see if they're clinically deteriorating, both in terms of the investigations and in terms of the history. Um, and really, that's all I have about, pick, uh, about pulmonary valve replacement. Thank you.